Hey everybody, today we're talking Invincible Compendium 3. Hey everybody, welcome back to BK's Bullets. As always, I'm your host, Sprint Casina, and today we're talking about Invincible Compendium 3. This hefty beast of a book is the last Invincible Compendium. This finishes out the series. This has issues 97 through 144. That's like, what, 13 years of comic books? Um, so it just recently wrapped up a few years ago. I believe when they started put out these compendiums is kind of when it was wrapping up. But um, yeah, it's the same three creators, Robert Kirkman, Ryan Atley, and Corey Walker, with a bunch of colorists and inkers. You got Cliff Rathburn on inks for a lot here. Mark Morales, Nathan Fairburn doing the colors. John Rausch. The colorist, he's the guy that's doing like the more, looks more like pencil-y stuff. It's a softer tone. The blacks aren't as heavy, not as dark. Um, I thought uh, FCL Placencia was doing some, I think in volume one and two. But anyway, they're not doing that here. So what did I think of the finale of the book? I liked it. I really did. This book, like the first book is so unique and so good because it feels so fresh. And there's so many different storylines, little one onesie twosies storylines, you know, one and dones, that kind of thing. It moves so fast. The second one is where we get into a little bit more like bigger arcs, longer form storytelling with Kirkman. And this one is really just like three arcs in these, I don't know, almost 50 issues. Um, you basically have the wrap up of what you started at the end of volume two with Invincible and Dinosaurus. Uh, is this a T-Rex looking guy and they they have a fight there's a thing where uh, he blows up Las Vegas and then they turn Las Vegas into like a giant solar farm after that because they they turn it to glass and now they can reflect better uh, there's a lot of death in this world that I was really surprised at that stuck not just with the heroes you know some of that is there as well some not not so much but in terms of the civilians, there's a lot of death in the Invincible world that sticks. And what I find humorous or amusing sometimes is that as much as Mark Grayson is trying to feel the deaths of all these people, the book and Kirkman just don't let him do it. Um, there's no way that he can feel the pain and suffering of all these people. There's no dark period. In, you know, He doesn't get depressed he starts to feel the weight of the world on his shoulders, but he's still written in such a way that it's like almost non-existent. You know what I mean? Um, so it's reflected, but it's you know it doesn't go the way of like uh, Man of Steel or Batman v Superman, where it's like the theme of the next arc or anything like that. You see Invincible change here, like he ended Volume Two with more of like a uh, an outlook, saying I'm gonna do what I want to do to help people and then it turns out that how he helps people is not you know changes from being a superhero to teaming up teaming up with dinosaurs to accomplish things scientifically and then that kind of changes here where he kind of changes his stance on killing towards the middle of the book uh, just all sorts of stuff and this book more than any of the other ones that maybe volume compendium 2 was a little bit more Viltrumite focused but that was more like the back half of the book this book is mainly focused on the stuff with the Viltrumites, with his home uh, alien race kind of thing. You have his dad uh, here. You have Thrag show up again, uh, and his dad is like the he's like the new emperor of the Viltrum Empire. And you have the show, the final showdown with Thrag towards the end of the book, and then you have another showdown with Robot for crying out loud because he kind of turned villainous here. Um, that was the other strange thing towards the end of Compendium 2 is the robots turn uh, towards more like an antagonist, you know, uh, just like this cold, detached person in some ways. And reading the books, like watching the show, the Invincible cartoon show, Robot is voiced by uh, Zachary Quinto, Spock from the newer Star Trek movies, right? Or Heroes, if you ever watched Heroes. And he has a very... I believe it's Zachary Quinto. He's a very detached, cold, um, iron-hearted voice to that character. Whereas 
reading the comics, like I never got that impression from Robot. I always got the thought and emotion from him once he came out of the robot body and into the clone of Rex Splode and things like that. And the fact that he takes his name Rex, it's just also kind of weird instead of, you know, being Rudy, his real name. But so I got more emphasis on emotion and feeling in the comics. So it's kind of weird to see this turn towards this um, all encompassing, just uh, bad guy kind of thing. And it's interesting because I still hear like his own voice in my head that I developed for him when I was reading the book. And I do not hear the cold robotic Zachary Quinto voice of the animated show. So I, I think if the animated show gets to that arc of robot, it will be very interesting to see how they do it because they've set him up so far as very, very cold. But I think the stuff with monster girl in the middle of the book, maybe well, might take him the other way. We'll see. We'll find out. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I think the more interesting thing here is the commentary on the, you know, the way of the world in that Kirkman like gives Robot the control of the planet and Invincible has to decide whether he's going to do something about it or just let it be if in fact it's actually better. Um, and there's a lot of time jumps in here too, like Invincible misses months of his life and then years of his life and in such a way that it's like painful to see how much he's actually missed and it's because one of those things with angstrom levy here uh towards like the first third of the book uh you know that he's like well i i'm done with earth i can't do this anymore you know i don't like that robot is doing what he's doing uh, and i gotta leave earth just to get my head straight so he does and that's basically where the book ends up, is that Mark Grayson's left Earth. He's no longer at the forefront of his mind, even though he's half human, technically. Uh, although they'll say, like, Vultramite DNA is almost pure when a Vultramite mates with a human. But he's still, like, not thinking about Earth at all. It's, it's kind of strange to see somebody who's not thinking of the planet they were raised on as, like, you know, all the time. So... You know, they, Mark and Eve just moved to space and they have a baby and it's just all sorts of things going on in space. And I did like the parts where Kirkman's exploring, like, what would it be like to live in space? What would it be like to live on an alien planet? Could you figure out what you can eat? You know, because everybody's got a different biology and eats different things. And how do you navigate that? Some strum stomachs are stronger than others. Are you going to get diarrhea that's going to kill you? Uh, all that sort of stuff is explored in here, which I thought was really fun. Um, the weirdest one, I think the one I dislike the most, is the reboot story arc. Where, um, and I'm trying not to go into the spoilers for each particular thing. I'm just giving you an overall gist of what is in this book, or if you've read it, what I liked and didn't like about it. You know what I mean? But the reboot arc, Mark encounters uh, some sort of like alien life form on one of these planets who then... It, it, I don't know if it creates an alternate dimension or takes him back in time almost and gives him the opportunity to relive his life in that first compendium, the first 12 issues, the first uh, 30 issues of Invincible. He talks to his dad and says, hey, I know what you're trying to do. Please don't try and take over the earth. And his dad's like, hey, what? Huh? You know, how's that happening? They still have some sort of a battle, but it's very different from the first time. And then he's working with um, Cecil to try and like, beat all these things that he let pass or didn't get to in time. You know, now that he knows the future, he's like beating everything to the punch. And it was an interesting storyline. I just didn't like the way that they ended it. Like Mark's just all of a sudden like, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm done. And the way that they like moved him back into the regular comic book and stuff like that, I was like, oh man, not again. Like there's... It was just another time jump that he's had in the, you know, he, I think he has like three or four significant ones, whether it's from being in an alternate dimension, being in the past, going out in space for war, like he misses so much. And uh, that one for me being a parent, like it just really hit hard. And I was like, oh, that sucks. And I just, I felt it like I didn't like it for him as a character. But I also didn't kind of didn't like it as a story because it just, it's like, all you're really trying to do is, is I felt like Kirkman's just trying to make another character talk. 
uh, instead of actually exploring uh, that time of that person's life, you know, with with a younger child, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I, I think it was very interesting too to see how the Viltrumites living on Earth are changing versus the Viltrumites out in space with Thrag uh, are not changing and how that ultimately resolves itself. There's an awesome fight. Like we always think about Superman fighting on the surface of the sun. Like there's a huge fight very similar to that uh, in this storyline towards the end at 140. Um, you know, very, very cool. And it did, the last issue, number 144, actually did something very similar to, um, not Saga, but Why the Last Man, another Brian, K, uh, different Brian K. Vaughn book, where it flashes forward, and it's, it's not flashing forward per se, because that last issue, Why the Last Man, some people love it, some people don't like it. I wasn't too hot on it, just because I felt like there was so much missing from the story of, like, it flashed forward to the end, and it was like, here's what's going on right now. And it never told you what happened up until that point. Whereas the last issue of Invincible does do that, which I appreciated so much. It's wrapping up loose ends, answering some questions. And some of it is like, hey, are you going to try and start a spinoff series with this? And it's like, yeah, maybe we could, but we don't want to. So we're not going to that kind of thing. So that was, that was a very interesting um, last issue, which, which I liked a lot. And I gotta hand it to you. Gotta hand it to Ryan Otley for you know almost 130 issues of near perfect comic goodness. And I'm just rounding to 130 because I know he didn't do the first seven, and then he stepped away for a couple issues in here and a couple issues in the second compendium to take a break on a vacation. But the man draws nearly every Invincible comic book there is. So you know if you want to count it as 125, 130, whatever it is. It is the majority of it, and he is definitely, you know, a super creator of, of an Invincible. And I don't know, did they? Okay, so now it says, no, it still says Invincible by Robert Kirkman and Corey Walker on here. I wonder if it was the animated show that said he was like a contributing creator, because there's certainly so many things in this book that get designed by Ryan Otley, from characters to villains to uniforms and things like that, that just... You know, it's just like this is clearly his book. It's no longer Cory Walker's, even though Cory Walker does come back from time to time for like these little fill-in stints and stuff like that. But it's very interesting that it's only these two artists on the entire series, and they're not so much as trading off as much as like giving the older, you know, the 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 create the co-creator a chance to come back and work on his own book. Uh, who knows the reasons why he left or whatever, but. It's clearly like a Kirkman and Otley thing. And even when you're reading the Cory Walker stuff, after he changes style here, uh, it's like, all right, cool, cool, cool. And then you get to the next issue and Ryan Otley comes back and you're like, oh, shit, yeah. I know stuff's going to go down because uh, we got a little bit of a break the last couple of issues. The stuff with Eve here is handled a little bit better. I said in the last compendium overview or review video that Eve is just kind of shoved to the wayside of just being like a whiny girlfriend. And in this compendium, she does kind of come back a little bit to her former self. She gets more adventures. She has more things to do. You know, they have a child together, so she's kind of raising that child. The, um, her fight with Thrag and Invincible's fight with Thrag on this alien world towards the end of the book right here. I don't want to show you this page because it's effing brutal. Um, shocked the hell out of me. And I literally thought that was the end of the book, even though I knew better. But how they resolved that with Eve and her powers, I thought was a little interesting. Um, and I wasn't a huge fan of it, I guess. It was like, huh, that's weird. And then when they use it again and again towards the end of the book, it's like, oh, okay. Well, it's not as interesting as I thought. Um, so it, it becomes more of a trope than a cool ability. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, yep, here's a magic savior moment because Eve can do this. So even I, so I don't like that power of hers. I'd rather have a little bit more finality because it does put her at risk more. And then once you know she can do this thing that I'm trying not to give away, uh, it just takes away that risk factor of Eve being in the book or being in a fight anymore because you're like, well, she's not really in danger. She can get beat the shit the same way Invincible can, just re you know resolves it differently. With a different way to heal so yeah but man I, I, I couldn't put these down 
literally, I, once I got sick with COVID a couple weeks ago, I started reading Compendium 1, I read 2, I read 3, and literally the next thing I'm reading is that Invincible Universe, Universe Compendium 1, That it's like a little skinnier, uh, that has all like the side characters, Guardians of the Globe, Guardians, um, Guardian of the Globe, there's like 18 issues in there, and some Adam, Eve, and Rexplode miniseries. So I'm reading that, and then I'm, I'm going to review that. But I'm so attached to this world. It's Honestly, I had a great experience reading these back to back to back. So if you have the gusto, if you have the time, and if you can hold these heavy books for as long as you can, uh, or find a reading table or whatever you, your thing is, if you can power through it, and I'm not saying power through it like it's a bad thing, but just, you know, go as fast as Invincible goes in the sky, reading through these books and do not give up. I really feel like that tale is so much fun to read in a super fast, uh, you know, consecutive way. Not thinking about anything else, not reading anything else, not stopping to go read a chapter of anything else. Just like, you know what, I'm going to commit to reading 144 issues of one comic book and nothing else until I finish. Like that journey for me I've, was really fun and really enjoyable. And I still think, you know, even if I gave this to you and said, hey, read this, you'd still find five or six issues and you'd stop, but you'd want to come back because that, like, I, I don't even know what arcs there are per se in this book. I just know what the issues were because of the covers. You know, I can't tell you like where an arc ends or begins. It's just so nonstop because there's seeds for the next one planted in the last one and so on and so forth. It just keeps going and going and going. Whereas like Walking Dead, I really did feel like they did have arcs or maybe the way those compendiums are. I think the way, the, yeah, the way those are, they're separated by arcs, not by issues uh, in those compendiums. So that could be a little bit different here. Um, but yeah, a whole lot of fun, really interesting tale. Really fun, beautiful art, beautiful storytelling. Uh, this is some of the best superhero comics you will ever read. Uh, Invincible, Compendium 1, 2, and 3, the whole damn series. So go check it out, and we will see you guys next time in the Funny Pages.